Hello and welcome to the Art of Social Justice and the official start to Arts Month 2020. My name is Andy Vick and I'm the Executive Director of the Cultural Office of the Pikes Peak Region. The Cultural Office is your local nonprofit arts agency that serves, supports, and advocates for arts and culture here in Colorado Springs and across El Paso and Teller counties. We're also the producer of our local Arts Month celebration each October, which is held in conjunction with National Arts and Humanities Month. After this panel session concludes, I invite you to learn more about Arts Month 2020 by visiting our brand new website at artsoctober.com. As I already mentioned, the Art of Social Justice is the official kickoff to Arts Month this year, and one of the ways that the Cultural Office has chosen to acknowledge the complex issues of race and equity that have reverberated throughout our community and across our nation for many years, and particularly in recent months. The Cultural Office is proud to be providing this virtual platform for an important and hopefully ongoing community dialogue. And I thank you for joining us and for being willing to listen and learn from the amazing panel of local creatives that has been assembled for this conversation. Speaking of our amazing panel, it's my pleasure to introduce you to the moderator of The Art of Social Justice, Mr. Rodney Gallet. Uh, Rodney, if you'd like to join me. How's it going, Andy? Good to see you, my friend. Uh, I've been my here now. Pardon me? I said, good to see you too, my fellow Rotarian. There you go. I've known Rodney for uh, several years now. We're both uh, members of the downtown uh, Colorado Springs Rotary Club. This past July, Rodney became the president of our club. Congratulations, Rodney. Uh, and he'll be the president for the coming year. During his installation as club president, Rodney gave a speech about the need for greater diversity in Rotary and the general need for more equity inclusion and social justice throughout our community and across our broader society. I was so inspired and impressed by Rodney's words at Rotary that I invited him to lead this conversation about the art of social justice. Rodney has selected the participating panel members and developed the questions and prompts, and he has total artistic control over the direction and flow of the conversation. My only prompts uh, to Rodney were that he approached the topic from an arts and cultural perspective and that he and the panel frame the conversation in a way that seeks to find positive solutions to very difficult and complicated issues. With all that said, it's my pleasure to hand over the virtual stage to Rodney, who will in turn introduce you to the panel members. Uh, thank you all for tuning in to join us. I look forward to seeing you again in about 90 minutes with some closing remarks. Rodney, it's all you. Thank you, my friend, and good evening, Olympic City, USA, and our friends around the world who are tuning in online. Welcome to Arts Month. We're bringing the month with the first event, the art of social justice. Social justice for all has been a pursuit that has lasted generations, and as you can see, we still have a lot of work to do. We're here today to discuss how the arts have impacted social change throughout American history, and most importantly, now. I have a panel of amazing professionals whose profession in the arts has led me to invite them for this discussion. I would like to welcome the following super awesome people. Ashley Cornelius. Ashley is a licensed professional counselor candidate and is the RISE program assistant at Denver Health. She has a master's degree in international disaster psychology from DU, go DU. She has worked internationally in Liberia and as a psychology teacher at the University of Harper. Domestically, she has worked on adolescent inpatient psychiatric unit for the last four years and used poetry therapy and act as her therapeutic modalities. Ashley Cornelius is a nationally recognized spoken word poet in Colorado. She won gold for the Colorado Springs Independent Best of Artist category in 2019. Congratulations. She was a woman of the World Poetry Slam, Colorado Springs representative in 2018, and she's been featured by the NAACP, TEDx Colorado Springs, Voyager Denver, NAMI, Pikes Peak Community College, the Colorado Springs Women's March, at the Inkwell, the Mercury Cafe, and events in Denver and Colorado Springs. Ashley is the co-director of Poetry 719, a Black-run poetry group in Colorado Springs that amplifies the voices of marginalized communities and people of color through art and creative self-expression. Ashley has a background in poetry 
Education and was the program director of an arts nonprofit in Denver focused on poetry workshops and curriculum. Ashley is committed to using poetry as a platform to speak up and out for marginalized groups and to be voice for those who have been silenced. Ashley, thank you for being on our panel today. Next up, I want to bring up Mr. Tony Exum Jr. Brother Tony. Brother Tony. Ladies and gentlemen, Tony Exum Jr. There right. you go. <laughs> right. How you doing, yeah. brother? Good to see you, man. National recording artist <laughs> Tony Exum Jr. is a contemporary jazz, R&B, and funk saxophonist, writer, and performer with a sultry and soulful sound. <laughs> In 2019, Tony released a single, My Name's Tony, receiving national airplay, charting on the Spook Jazz Network Top 100 chart for several weeks. In addition, My Name's Tony Springs Summer 14 City Tour included performances at the San Diego Smooth Jazz Festival in San Diego, California, Spagnetti's in Long Beach, California, the Soil Dove Underground in Denver, Colorado, Jazz in the Park in Prattville, Alabama, and the Winter Park Jazz Festival in Winter Park, Colorado, to name a few. Beyond work, as a recording artist, Tony has embarked in a career in radio hosting on Carl Springs FM Jazz Station 93.5 FM with over 20 hours a week of on-air time. In addition, Tony yes. has entered a business venture in late 2019 with Kat Silvaca as a global brand ambassador. Ladies and gentlemen, I give to you Mr. Tony X and Jr. Thanks for being here. Hi, Tony. everybody. Hey. Me. Appreciate it. Next, I'd like to bring up Lynn Hastings. Can we bring in Lynn? Hey, Lynn. Good to see you, sister. You too. Lynn, Lynn has been part of the Colorado Springs art community as an actor, producer, board member, and supporter of nearly 25 years. A Sierra High School graduate. Where's all the Sierra folks at? I know you're proud. <laughs> Lynn attended Colorado State University and graduated from the American Musical and Dramatic Academy in New York City. Lynn has been recognized as Best Actress and Best Supporting Actress in the Gazette's Best Of series. She's also recognized for her work by the Pikes Peak Arts Council in 2012 with their Best Actress Award. Past performances include A Raisin in the Sun. I saw that one, that was really good. <laughs> Happy Day, Christmas Carol, Joe Turner's Come and Gone, Seven Guitars, and Doubt at Theater Works. Uh, Hairspray, Intimate Apparel, and Little Shop of Horrors at the Fine Arts Center, and Afterlife, A Ghost Story, Motherhood Out Loud and Julius Caesar at set. Lynn is proud to be a part of Idea Stages, Inclusion, Diversity, Equity, and Access on Stages, an urgent new Colorado initiative, theater initiative, with a mission to galvanize theater makers to make uh, demonstrable action towards inclusion, diversity, equity, and accessibility. She recently mentored a young artist for their Outspoken Youth program. This is the start of change and accountability in the Colorado theater community. And she hopes to see more groups like Ideas created in the Colorado arts community in support of the We See You White American Theater Movement. Find out more about these programs online, um, uh, we see you what.com. Lynn also ha is a proud to be a member of the Arts Vision 2030 Cultural Planning Committee for our Pikes Peak region. Lynn is a happy wife of actor David Hastings. Hey, David and a proud mom of Trevor and Maya. Hey, Trevor and Maya. Thank you for being here. Thank Lady you for having me. You. And last but certainly not least, Goddess Taisha. Where you at, Taisha? There she is. Hi, Goddess everyone. Taisha is a community influencer who strives toward justice in order to empower people that, she, that have been historically disenfranchised by the current structures in society. She has over 15 years of experience in local communities with youth and young adults, Originally from Harlem, New York. Go Harlem. Taisha has worked in Harlem and the South Bronx on campaigns with local youth focusing on education reform, school to prison pipeline, and social justice GD. Environmental justice, water quality and food access, and immigration, the original DREAM Act. During this time, she decided to become a formal teacher in social studies with a huge belief that a people without the knowledge of their past history, origin, and culture is like a tree without the roots. That's not her, that's Marcus Garvey. In addition, that an ed, uh, educated public can make better decisions for the future. Graduating in 2013 from Fordham University with a dual master's in education, social studies seventh through 12th grade and special education K through 12. 
She proceeded to build groups in high schools to empower young people. Her last position as a formal teacher was at Liberty High School in D20, where she instructed social studies and psychology. She's a proud parent, partner, and friend, working for Inside Out to create a safe space for LGBTQ plus youth and building capacity with compassion and grace to eradicate racism, homophobia, and the oppression of people. Goddess Taisha has worked with the NAACP, Youth Ministries for Peace and Justice, the Black Women's Alliance, and multiple organizations in New York combating homelessness. Currently, she's a board president of the Empowerment Solidarity Network, member of the NAACP, and associated with many community and arts groups, hot, hot comb poets, heard you guys before, very good, uh, here in Colorado Springs. So ladies and gentlemen, yeah. I'd like to welcome Taisha to our group. So here we are. It's time to have a conversation that people have been waiting to have, and we're going to guide them through it. So I'd like to start the first question off with uh, Lynn. Okay. okay. Lynn, does it feel like theaters need somebody dedicated specifically to the work of diversity, equity, and inclusion? I do think it's important that theaters have a dedicated person in their leadership level. So it's, you know, executive or above. It's been an initiative in American theater for so long, and initiatives come and go. And if you make it about your truth, it's the truth of, of your organization, it's what your value is, and you have somebody committed to it, you can take it from being an initiative to a reality. And I think it's really important that white theaters, predominantly white institutions, do have someone who's dedicated specifically to equity, diversity, and inclusion, okay? Um, so that they can make it a reality. So it's not just doing a show written by a playwright of color every couple of years where you don't even think about having to do it. It's just part of your culture and you just do it. it you have three, four shows. You're hiring designers of color. You're, you're hiring directors of color. And that is part of your truth as an organization. And, you know, organizations are always so resource poor. If you have someone who's dedicated to that particular focus, I think we can see more accomplished than we have. It's It's been an initiative in American theater for so long, but you know we just don't have any traction. And I think what has happened this year has forced some of um, the predominantly white institutions to look at that and dedicate themselves to making this a reality. And, um, and it's not an initiative anymore. It's part of who they are. It is their culture. Thank you, Lynn. Um, one of the one of the things that struck me about what you said is the diversity, equity, and inclusion is a part of an organization's truth. And I want to give a shout out to the city of Colorado Springs right now. And I want to give another shout out to my dear friend Danielle Somerville, who is has been hired as the diversity and community outreach programs manager for the city. So I want to give her a hand. Now it's a little bit outside the arts realm, but the fact that this is happening in different organizations because they're starting to yep. realize the truth that they have to seek to get this done the way it needs to be done. So um, good job, City of Colorado Springs, and congratulations, my sister. Uh, Tony, question for you, brother. How has recent events in the area of social justice affected your creative output? Oh, Tony's gone. Okay, we'll wait for Tony to come back in a second. Ashley, question for you. Right. How have you used your art to support and tell the story of Black women? Yeah, um, thank you for that question. I, I think that's like my whole purpose in terms of art. So I grew up here in Colorado Springs and the only Black woman I really saw was my mom. Um, or if I went to church, then that's like the only time I ever saw other women who looked like me. And so my art really is to start to share about what our experiences are um, and to break this idea of a monolith, right? That like me as a black woman does not represent every single black woman or femme. And so I'm using my art to, to explain the ways in which we exist in this world. And as Malcolm X said, right, we're the most disrespected and undervalued folks in America. 
Um, and so I want to bring light to that and also to expose the fact that like we are brilliant, resilient, exceptional, fantastic folks. Um, and the big part of the work is exposing the fact that we are humans, right? Just because we're magic doesn't mean we're not real. Um, and we get to mess up and we get to make mistakes and we get to be late um, and we get to, you know, <sighs> have failures and feel sad and experience pain. Um, and I think when we think about black women, it is always the strong, black, powerful, independent black woman. And yes, that is what so many of us are. Um, and I'm using my poetry to say, and we're sad and we're depressed and we feel pain and joy um, and really trying to provide a holistic picture for what it means to be a black woman. Um, and also I'm striving to be a model of possibility, which means um, I'm trying to represent that it is possible to get on a stage and perform in front of folks as a black woman, that you can win an award as a best artist as a black woman and continue to pave the way for other folks. Um, and similar to what Lynn was talking about, right? The arts community largely, um, is a wider community. And so how do we infiltrate? How do we get on stage? How do we let people know I am here, I have paved the way and to let me lift other people up. Um, and so that's a lot of what I'm doing, especially with Poetry 719 is when there's an opening for a poet or an artist, I'm pulling in someone who is black. I'm pulling in someone who's a woman, who's a femme, who's non-binary, who's trans, um, because we need that representation on stage. Outstanding, thank you. That was an excellent answer to that one. Uh, brother Tony, you're back. Welcome. Welcome back, brother. So my question for you, uh, how has the recent events uh, in the area of social justice affected your creative output? The dichotomy on its effective, how it's affected me, um, one from an emotional standpoint and the other from um, a business standpoint. Um, it's been really hard to, uh, for me personally, to uh, kind of articulate musically what I really want to say about how I've been feeling about what's been going on. Being an instrumentalist, um, sometimes when you do, you write songs or you, you perform, you know, your performance is subject to uh, interpretation and it could be, you know, subjective to the person who's listening. So you may not, maybe trying to invoke a certain idea uh, through your instrument, but it may not come across to that person what it is that you're trying to say. So um, it's been kind of hard for me to uh, really express exactly what, you know, um, I want to say about what's going on. I think what I'm going to have to probably do, and this is very true with a lot of creatives, sometimes in the moment, we may not have the words or the, uh, the ideas or the thoughts to come across as effectively as we want to. Sometimes we have to process it first. And then um, when it's, when it settles, uh, or when something else has happened or when, you know, uh, maybe society as a whole has moved on from something or to the next situation, which is how it's been probably since 2020 started. It's just been one thing after the next kind of a domino effect. Um, then after in the aftermath is sometimes when you find that melody or you find that that track or you find that uh, that solo or whatever. And I'm speaking from a saxophone player's um, perspective to maybe voice what it is that you're trying to say. So it's been, it's been, a, I don't want to get in here and make it seem like I've been a champion at it. It's been really hard for me to figure out exactly how to um, speak musically um, to get my thoughts across. On the business side, you know, of course, with uh, outside of just social justice with COVID-19, that's, you know, slowed down, you know, tremendously, but it's been um, actually a blessing lately to have some other platforms uh, in smaller venues to be able to to perform and then maybe invoke conversations about what's going on or maybe play a song that's dedicated to that idea or what's going on out there, you know, um, and letting that other, some other, maybe another, you know, instrumental version of another another tune. Like uh, recently I did a gig where I played, um, someone asked me to play A Change Is Gonna Come. And so I just poured my heart into it. Um, I had no musical accompaniment behind it. Um, but I was able to maybe convey some of the, you know, emotions that I've been feeling through that, but that's through another piece of music that I didn't write. So um, that's kind of been my thing, just kind of find different avenues to make, you know, make my voice heard. And uh, I think as fellow creatives, you know, we all get to that point where, um, man, can I say that? Can I do that? Is this too harsh? Is this too black? You know, especially being in a, in a community like where we are. <laughs> and, 
And do we should we care that our blackness is being um, gauged by our words and actions and thoughts, or should we just say what we have to say? Uh, are we in a situation where it's appropriate to be sensitive to that, or should we just come out and say what it is that we're feeling? Um, and again, I don't. I'm not a poet or a singer. I'm an instrumentalist. So trying to find that fine line um, is a very interesting dichotomy for me uh, to to handle that. So, you know, it's, um, it's a work in progress. Yeah, that is true. It is a work in progress and we all have a lot of work to do with it. Um, not just us on the panel, but everybody in the sound of my voice, you all have work to do. Uh, right. God is Taisha. Question for you, my sister. Um, how does art influence your perspective on social justice? Um, I think that art has been an outlet for that. Um, I think for a very long time I had a, um, a huge difficulty trying to figure out what that looked like for me um, as a person of color, as a black woman in today's society, as a Latina, as a queer person. Um, and so, and I've always, always been very passionate about change and what that looks like growing up a Garvite, hence why that's in my, um, in my biography. Um, I always felt like this huge passion around the fact that this was not okay and we needed to do something about it. And so in that, I feel like it's played a huge role in me, particularly during my youth age, of figuring out how to get my anger out um, and um, figuring out how to do that through art. And so I used many different mediums for a while and I feel like poetry is the one that stuck best because I didn't have to hide my emotions and I could just write them out, you know, and however they sounded, um, it didn't It didn't necessarily matter to me at least um, because they were my feelings and they were my emotions. And I was able to take more ownership through art of my emotions and my feelings and figure out how that looks like and become more intellectually, um, intelligent through that platform. Um, poetry really gave me that line to do that. And so I was community organizing at the age of 12 the first time I community organized my block to start, um, what is it, a, a council of some sort because there were some things happening like gentrification in Harlem <laughs> and it was becoming really obvious. Mm -hmm. And how do we combat that? And so at 12, I was doing that. But at 15, I was angry and I was annoyed and I was enraged and I didn't know how to do, deal with those emotions. And coming from the black community, you're not really allowed to feel, right? Um, <laughs> take them feeling somewhere else, especially at, at my age at that time. Um, and so poetry really gave me that outlet to be able to write down all my poetry. And then when I started to perform and I started to feel other people's emotions through that, right? Because they are feeling my emotions, but they're also, as they're in taking my emotions, I'm in taking theirs. It gave me this outlet of release. And so um, it was a duality and I felt differently connected with people that felt my lived experience. Um, and then also being a professional now, it's more of this understanding of, yes, I'm a person of color and I have all these array of feelings and you have to deal with them. This is the reality, right? Um, particularly in Colorado Springs political plight. Wow. Great perspective on that. Thank you. Um, yes. So that leads me to yes. another question for all of you. You kind of all touched on it. So it seems organic for me to ask this next. And I'll start with Ashley. Um, how do you feel, how do you view the Springs as a place for creators? Mm, indeed. Mm. <laughs> right. So here's what I'll say is that art for me in creation is the antithesis of destruction. So when there is pain, when there is fire, when there is like trauma, people turn to art and create, right? Dark ages, renaissance, mm -hmm. like that's what we do is like we build when we grow. And so uh, if we keep that right, analogy going, this is the perfect place to create art. It is the perfect place, especially for marginalized communities to create, because I know I have experienced a lot of pain and trauma growing up here in Colorado Springs, and it's like walking downtown. Um, and so if that's kind of the experience, right, of living in a predominantly white city and working within the, the politics and the network, it only makes sense that like we are fantastic. 
so truly and deeply that like this is a place to create um and we're moving forward right i think a, a, a while ago i couldn't name black artists black theater companies like i just didn't know and so i think we are exposing and revealing that there is so much art and talent in a variety of different artistic mediums um, and so I think this is the place, and this is also the place to scream the loudest, right? Where like people need to hear it. And similar to what Tony was saying, like our art needs to be loud. It needs to be a cacophony. Like we need to like, honestly, like square up in terms of our art um, because it's time, right? And Colorado Springs, I think is ready. And if Colorado Springs isn't ready, I know we as creatives are, and we're ready to just like let our art really shine and um, help in the, in the healing of our community. Outstanding, I like that one. Uh, Lynn, same question. How do you view the Springs as a place for creatives? Stand by, we gotta unmute you first. Sorry about that, oh. just talking to myself in my, <laughs> my office here. Um, I agree with Ashley that it's getting better, but I think because with the sin, the city is so predominantly white. It, allyship is extremely important. Um, as a theater artist, uh, the theater companies that are in this town are predominantly white run institutions. So allyship is extremely important to the creatives of color uh, in Colorado Springs. We won't continue to grow unless our allies support us. And that's the key thing to help the creatives in this town uh, get the exposure that they need, the support that we need when we do get loud, <laughs> right? We need someone to have our backs. Um, and so allyship, I think, is extremely important to creatives of color in this town, um, making the impact that I know that we can, because there is a phenomenal amount of talent in this town, and they just need the platform to speak. And that takes allies in this town. That's the only way it's going to happen. Right on, right on. Brother Tony, same question. How do you view the Springs as the place for creatives? <clears throat> um, I agree with both both my ladies here. Uh, this is a very difficult um, community uh, for people of color and for Black people to, uh, you know, to thrive, to survive, even in the artistic uh, community, to to make a living. Um, but it's not so difficult to be creative. We have a large voice and see what's really interesting about coming from a city that has a history like Colorado Springs of being predominantly white, predominantly Republican, um, and a military complex all in one, that is a cacophony within itself. Uh, just those, those elements. So when we are, since we've been here, you know, one of the things that I remember as I was coming up was always feeling like, um, it was always this undercurrent of potentiality with everybody that was, you know, in the music business or or in arts and theater, but no real, like, um, never seen anybody get over that hump. You know, I think I was one of many, one of a few that that went national, that came from my generation, that didn't stop. Uh, but I always had more of a, a world view of, of what was going on in the music business in general. So I knew it wasn't going to stop with Colorado Springs or Denver for that matter. You know, I think I'm equally part of that community as well. But now I'm seeing all this, all this greatness. I'm seeing this, this wave of greatness, you know, with these ladies here, with the reminders, with, um, um, let's see who else, uh, just, I, I can, I can't think of all the names right now, but just this, um, and it's not a monolith of talent either. I mean, it's on all on all platforms, poetry, arts, dance, acting, music, um, and art itself. You know, all these all these young black artists that are that their paintings are speaking loud to the community and they're and they're being bought and they're being curated and they're uh, they're being respected, you know, and some of our allies are the reason for that. So I definitely agree with Lynn about that. Then we've got, you know. Uh, new, you know, more voices on radio. We have a black owned radio station for the first time in Colorado Springs history. Now we have several options on radio that are predominantly uh, run by, by, uh, <clears throat> by people that look like us, you know, over at jazz nine, three, five, I'm the only one um, right now anyway, but uh, having been an artist all these years, you know, I've been able to use that platform to make sure that our indigenous art form jazz music it's, it's going to stay on the air, you know, and uh, Colorado Springs has one of the few, you know, locally owned and independent operated jazz stations in the country right now. 
So there's all these different things that are that are going on that are great. I just I would just like to see that all um, galvanize into this movement to where Colorado Springs becomes this place where you want to be to experience all this talent. Um, I don't want it to be the basement thing anymore. You know, that's the analogy I use. You start out in the basement and you get to the the living room, then you go up to the you know to the to the top floor, then hopefully you can get to the penthouse. You know, we need to be at the penthouse because our level of talent, our level of dedication um, and that undercurrent of of support that we've had amongst each other is already there. But the platform at large needs to be pushed out um, a lot stronger. And I see it happening. I see a really good movement happening. But, you know, we got to stick to it. We got to we got to maintain and we have to be consistent to see that happen uh, the way that I'm envisioning it, which is like Colorado Springs is on the map. You know, it's not just about Denver anymore. Um, And having been part of both of those communities, I'm trying to get Denver to realize that, you know, stop overlooking Colorado Springs. You know, Denver comes kind of has this mentality where, you know, it's one city with, uh, uh, you know, several predominantly black, historically black neighborhoods. So it's almost like they feel like they're the blackest thing east of Texas, west of California. It's not true. You know, we have our own... uh, history down here in Colorado Springs and we're just 66 miles down the road. So it can't be that different, you know what I'm saying? Um, And then eventually we can kind of come together to put the whole entire state on the map. But there's a unique um, element that Colorado Springs brings to the table. And that's what I'm seeing right now. I just wanted to to grow. So that's why, you know, as much as I perform in Denver and Aurora and, uh, you know, I spend a lot of time there, I still have a a very... um, strong uh desire to see Colorado springs you know do its thing on that level awesome and and colorado springs is doing its thing it's getting done yes people like you. um Thank that you. Is Taisha. how do you view the springs as a place for creatives um i have a mi- i agree with what everybody's saying i really like where it's going um having been here for five years and when i got here i was like i don't know where to get my african shea butter i don't know where to get my adobo (laughs) there's no (laughs) culture and i'm very used to like you know like these singular communities you know when i want to go get korean food i know exactly where to go um and that was really difficult for me when i came um and but i've been really happy to see all the mural work happening and artists really collaborating in really beautiful way and giving each other the space to do so. Um, I still think that we, as I am excited to see allies coming up into that world and also supporting financially and what is it bringing spaces? But I think sometimes when they bring spaces, they don't understand all the layers that is to bring an artist. You know what I mean? Sometimes they can bring a lot of limitations to what that looks like. Um, and at times that makes you very weary of what their intentions really are, particularly in art, because it's very different, you know, and part of art is that freedom part. And the hard part is that our freedoms look very different in in today's culture, in today's society, in today's institutions. So it's one of those things that, um, and I think Tony had touched upon this, they, you don't know where those borderlines are still in Colorado Springs, you know, is this too radical? And also being an artist and being in different professions or being in different circles. And obviously there's a business aspect to this, right? Like that's the reality. And wanting to push, pull more people into the into the circle, right? Because the crazy thing is, you know, one person here in Colorado Springs, unfortunately, you know, everyone, um, but it is getting bigger and we have to get ready for that, right? So while we're pulling people in, allowing that freedom, unfortunately, that allyship can can sometimes be misconstrued of like, is this too black? Is this too radical? You know what I mean? I know that as an artist, sometimes I'm like, do I really want to share this on paper? Do I really want people to hear this? Right? Because I have, I have my piles, you know, I have the watered down and then I have the real stuff, right? And how that looks sometimes doesn't come out and flow as quickly because I am in Colorado Springs versus I was in New York, it'd be not a problem or Denver does feel a little bit more comfortable. The reality is that as a black woman, I have walked down the street and been cursed out and threatened right in down south, downtown Colorado Springs just this past summer. So we're not that far-fetched, right? The reality is that, and that is funny enough, feeds into my art, but at the same time, 
feeds into another system that makes me worried, is this safe to do so? So I think, uh, you know, being a community organizer in that sense, it's become very difficult as to how much do I want to be exposed because I don't feel that safe here in Colorado Springs. Um, and I know that a lot of people have expressed that to me. So as much as we're moving forward, as we're being limited by our structures, right? Our societal structures. So I'm glad you brought that up, Taisha. I'm gonna yes. uh, take where you, you left off about the safety piece um, and bring it back to, uh, to Ashley. Ashley, when does the work get dangerous or bring up conversations that people don't want to hear? Uh, yeah, always. As soon as you open your mouth, as soon as you pick up a paintbrush, I think, right, our existence is political, right? Our, our art is inherently political because we are the ones who are creating it. And so I think, for me at least, it's always dangerous, right, of just like a Black woman speaking openly about the experiences that I have or racism, oppression, sexism, homophobia. It's dangerous, right? And I've gotten I've got nasty comments. I've been threatened. Poetry 719 has to mitigate every time we do Black Voices Matter because people hate it. Um, and so, right, there's a level of, of danger. Um, but I always think about that, right? I think many of us present on stages, um, perform at protests, do demonstrations. And so I think inherently there is something scary about it um, and the ways in which people often want to express their anger towards us and projecting it. Um, and so it is dangerous and it can be really scary um, and it's necessary, right? I think um, sometimes we have to be on those stages and that's similar to what Lynn was saying, that's where allies come in, right? If you know I'm on stage saying some real stuff and like, you got to protect me. Someone needs to stand near me. Someone needs to know, um, someone needs to help me get this information out. Um, because if we, right, we weren't allowed to read. We weren't allowed, we weren't allowed to learn how to read, how to talk. We couldn't laugh. I had to cover my hair. Like every aspect of my body was censored. Um, and so when we as artists, especially black artists, stop censoring ourselves, people get scared. Um, and that's when I think that danger comes in. And so this call to action is to protect us so that our art can continue to be dangerous and make changes, but that we can live to see the revolution, right? I want to stay alive. And I want my, I don't want my art to survive me, right? I want to continue with my art for as long as I can. Um, and we need people to stand in the gap so that we know those boundary lines so that we can express ourselves in a way that is important and relevant. Thank you for that. Lynn, same question to you. When does the work get dangerous and bring up conversations that people don't want to hear? Well, I think art's supposed to make people have those discussions that they don't want to have. That's that's why we're here. We're supposed to solicit a response. Um, you know, it's a call and response. And so I think in this day and age, we've gotten to the point where it's like, I'm not afraid to make people uncomfortable. One, because I think we have allies. We feel like we have allies. But also two, we focused on not making people uncomfortable and it hasn't gotten us very far. It hasn't gotten us to where we need to get um, as a society. And um, I remember when we were doing American Prom at Theater Works and we were doing spoken word before it, it made some of our patrons uncomfortable what folks were saying. And I would talk to them about, you know, what did you think? And it's like, wow, it's really, really made me uncomfortable. But man, it was powerful. I didn't know people felt that way. And I was a little uncomfortable, but I totally understand why this has to happen so that we can have conversations like you and I are having. And I said, you should spend time talking with the poet, the artist, and talk to them about how that made you feel and why did they write it and where did this come from? Because that is what art is supposed to do. It's supposed to bring people together and create community and start discussion. And if it's uncomfortable, that's okay doesn't mean you stop having the conversation. And I think that's that's where we need to be right now. It does get dangerous. I had somebody call me the N-word driving by my car the other day. And, you know, it is dangerous. And like Ashley said, I want to survive my art. I want to, I want to survive my art. I want to make a difference. Um, and that, again, is where we need allies. We need allies to help us 
with those uncomfortable conversations. If someone else who's white is in there saying, I'm uncomfortable too, it's okay, let's talk about it. That's why we're here, it's okay. Let's be respectful, but it's okay to be uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we gotta talk it out. We have to build a bridge. And you know, the thing about building bridges, you gotta be ready to be walked on. Um, Absolutely. And it takes resiliency and, and temperance and fortitude. And that's stuff that has been put in our, our blood for generations. Yes. So, um, Brother Tony, I want to ask you the same question. Um, when does the work get dangerous or bring up conversations that you don't want to hear? You know, it's it's uh, it's crazy. You know, it's, it seems like that's always in the back of our minds as black entertainers, as black people that have uh, that have a unique voice or way to express things that are going on in the world or in our world, in our communities through art. Like we always have to have that that mindset in the back of our heads that, you know, this could get real really quick. Um, a lot of times it's a weird situation because I don't know if you guys have experienced this, but it seems like, you know, we would be nothing but in words to some of these people if we didn't have a horn or a pen or a paintbrush or uh, a script, you know, we, we tend to get, you know, put in positions that we're, we're okay, we're entertained, okay, you're cool. But then when we start using that voice to express things that don't want to be talked about, then all of a sudden that acceptance goes away and uh, with some with some individuals. So we have to be we have to be on the forefront of that all the time. But in the spirit of resolving any situation in any relationship, difficult conversations have to be held. And if they have to be moderated, if they have to be approached on several, you know, several platforms or several situations, then so be it. But, you know, um, like like Ashley was saying, I want to I want to live through my art. Have you I'm getting tired of black martyrdom in the arts. OK, you don't care about us until we get murdered. You don't realize what we were trying to say until until we die. You know, then it becomes, oh, wow, this guy was really deep. Oh, this this young lady really had something to say or when it happens tragically or due to um, experiences of social injustice, then it's like a you know temporary wake up call. And then we become, you know, sometimes unsung heroes when we could have been vessels, you know, uh, that lead to some of these uh, resolving some of these issues and, and approaching and, and, and abolishing, you know, uh, some of these things that we've been dealing with, you know, um, Music and especially with music, you know, we always at the forefront of, of, of uh, social change. You know, could you imagine Motown not being around during the civil rights era or the Stax records or the blues? Could you imagine if we were muffled and we weren't able to sing those Negro spirituals, which were what I call uh, directory assistance from one plantation to the next, sending messages, you know, and telling stories? Could you imagine if we didn't have that and that morphed into every bit of uh, creative music that's come out of this this country that's why i said you know with jazz and i'm when i say jazz i'm including r&b blues pop gospel as our indigenous art form this is what we gave to the world coming from uh our circumstances here in this country so if we didn't have that which also you know in a sense influenced other forms of art because music has been synchronized with with movies or with the paintbrush or as a backdrop to poetry, to strong words being said, you know, some songs are pretty much just poems set to music, you know, and then we saw that happen with the advent of hip hop and that scared everybody because not only were we talking about what was going on, but we were in your household, in your living room, telling you about it. And your kids was like, wait, how come I don't know about that? How come I didn't, mom, how come you didn't tell me it was that, 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 that my friend over here, you know, that I go to school with that this is what he has to deal with, or that's what his parents went through or his grand grandparents went through. How come you never let me watch them on television? Well, now we're everywhere, so you have no choice but to hear a voice. But, you know, in the same sense, get a little bit, you start pushing that envelope a little bit too much and you get away from the entertainment value of it. You start getting a little too intellectual, then it starts to become a problem. Have you guys noticed as black entertainers, as black creatives, sometimes the more profane or funny or, or outlandishly controversial we are, the more they love us. But the very nanosecond we get a little political or we start talking about our voice, all of a sudden we're a threat. All of a sudden it's a problem. Yep. All of a sudden it's, why are you so angry? You know, 
as if because I play saxophone the way I do, or I, I write this really cool poem about something funny, or um, I'm a comedian and I'm making you laugh about everyday life, that I don't experience these things, that I don't have uh, these worries on my mind. I don't have these concerns. I didn't just see somebody that, you know, that I knew get shot or killed uh, in the streets or whatever the case may be, or somebody get locked up. You know, we have, we've always had to be this mask for our own realities, for their entertainment. And that's not always been fair. So now, you know, it gets dangerous because we're saying, listen, we have something we need to say. If you are who you say you are, you know, if you are the, if you want to go on this, this tangent, you know, the colorblind individual uh, who's totally accepting, then even if it is uncomfortable for you, there should be no hesitation for us to have this conversation. And maybe you even have a perspective that we can listen to because, you know, we're on the, on the other side of the fence. So there might be something that we're saying or doing that we may not realize, but if we don't do it, it stays, it doesn't go anywhere. And here we are in 2020, almost 2021, having some of the same conversations that our parents had to have in the sixties, our grandparents had to have in the forties, but you're telling me that everything's okay. And that's where, no, that's not acceptable because if it was, I should be able to look at my 16 year old daughter and be like, let me tell you how it used to be. And there was a time when blah, 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 blah. But now she's seeing as a 16 year old, you know, that, wow, this, you went through that too, dad. Or, <clears throat> you know, I've, I've told her stories about her great grandparents, you know, and what they went through living in Colorado Springs. My mother was in high school around the time of uh, um, the Black Klansman story. And my dad, I believe, knew that gentleman because he had just joined the fire department around that same time. So there was a lot going on in our city uh, from that side of the fence. And my mother told me when she first got here, there was a lot of Jim Crow-ish stuff going on. She moved out here from New Orleans in the mid 60s with the family. And she remembers, you know, walking home from school uh, with her cousins and white people saying, you better hurry up and get your black asses home. You know, and no, you can't play in this, you can't play in this park. You guys need to go over there. Prospect Lake, for example. That's why the south side of the lake is like, we used to call it the black side of the lake. Cause that's where we congregated. Cause they didn't even want us across this little pond that they call a lake in Colorado Springs in a city that's supposed to be completely integrated. So there's little bits of history like that, you know, or my father being at work, being one of the few black firefighters in the history of Colorado Springs and they call them buckwheat when they call them to, to work, you know, tell them to report to the plantation and stuff like that. Little tiny stories like that, that, you know, our parents went through that, uh, has not changed. So these young ladies telling me that in 2020, you're being called the N word, you know, driving your car or you're being threatened because you have a voice or you're getting, you know, nasty DMs and emails or on a chat room and people are attacking you because you're talking about some of the same conditions that should have went away a long time ago based on what the current narrative is that this stuff doesn't really exist and that it's just all in our heads and that we need to get over it or what have you. So as, as being the, as right now, as back creators, we are in the forefront sometimes of the voice. We are the voice. They took our leaders away from us. Every last one of our leaders got assassinated. Hasn't been one since that, since Martin Luther King got killed, nobody's really stepped up on that level because they probably feared from their life. So that was the last generation of that level of bravery. So then if you notice since the mid seventies or since the eighties, the entertainment world became this like voice, this integrating vessel. Our leaders who um, probably are more articulate and more skilled in that area so now they look to us, you know, as either the on the front lines or in defense or in celebration or, you know, as reporters of what's going on in our communities or how we see things going on in this country. And, and it's really a shame that we even have to use the word, when does it get dangerous? Why should it be dangerous for the four of us to do what we do best? You know, why should it be dangerous for me to be able not to be able to speak with my experiences in this, this so-called free country? It shouldn't be any level of danger at all, but you know, it really is scary. <clears throat> and the more you get into that uncomfortable level and you start calling people and making them accountable about their viewpoints, the more you gotta watch it back. And uh, our allies have to be the ones that say, no, we're not having it. You're not touching these people like that. You're not gonna attack them. We're gonna sit down and have this conversation. Just like I saw that meme about, uh, I used to see this meme about uh, relationships and it was something about staying together is like, okay, you mad? Okay, well, you can go sit in another room, but uh, we're going to have this conversation later. Like, we're not going to end this because you mad. Go over there, sit in that room. Don't look at me for, for a day or two and then come back here. We're going to talk. 
So we're going to have to have that kind of a um, conversation, you know, until we can somehow get to to some kind of a resolve, you know, whatever that may look like. That was some very, some very touching narrative there, my brother. Um, I think that there's an <laughs> expectation uh, for us to just take it. Yeah. You know, in perpetuity, just forever. <laughs> and yes, that yes. has not been what we've been made of uh, throughout generations. We haven't just took it. We've been fighting right. our way out of it for generations. And, mm -hmm. you know, we're still fighting still fighting. Um, you know, Taisha, I want to pose that question to you too about uh, when the work gets dangerous um, and people don't want to hear it. Um, I think it was dangerous the minute I stepped into Colorado Springs. I'm going to be real. I think <laughs> being a person of color here, eating me, uh, you know, and, um, you know, there is this Unfortunately, there is a huge amount of people that think that black people are supposed to be in these categories or act in a certain demeanor or a certain way. And so that was very difficult for Frontally coming from a very different type of culture, coming from New York, who is not passive aggressive, um, coming from a Latino based Harlemite, you know, it was just very dangerous to start off with. Um, I think we mask it very well in the Springs. Um, and so, you know, if you stay in certain groups and in certain spaces, you'll never see anyone of a different culture or you'll never kind of be integrated um, in a way. And so I think it became more dangerous when, I don't, I don't know when it became more dangerous. I just always never felt comfortable. You know, I feel like it is instinctually un uh, understanding of people to know where they feel safe in their environment and where they don't, right? Um, you know when you feel welcome, then you don't. I've gone to bars to listen to live jazz here in Colorado Springs, and I immediately know when I come in that I am not welcome in that space, um, and that if I I, I should leave. <laughs> um, and so you know we do live in that plethora, but we also live in that plethora in many other places, and that's one thing that I do try to emphasize. Colorado Springs is not something special. The reality is that is our country, okay? Um, being a person of color, being educated is a threat. If I know English and I don't have an accent, I am an immediate threat to my white counterpart because up to a certain degree, I have resilience, you know what I mean? I've been through life and I understand it in a different way. And the reality is that as much as they have tried to oppress us, they haven't been able to because we've gone through the arts and we're creating, we're creators. That resilience has built us to make a bigger amount of art that not saying anything, they just want to tap into on a regular basis. That's the reality. And so the thing about it is we do come of a people that want to come to the table and like break bread, you know what I mean? And we can create together and, you know, we just have a different mentality, but I think that we are, Day, I mean, I think walking anywhere in America at this point is dangerous. And that is the reality. The reality is that I don't feel safe with my son walking in the street. And until that becomes safety, it doesn't matter if he's doing art. Let's be real. Like, black boys are dying in this state right now. Black boys have died in this state for just walking down the street and being black. So the reality is, is that I don't have to be an artist. I could go along with American culture and I would still be dangerous or in danger for being a person of color. And that, you know what I mean? And we have grown into, like, I was talking to a friend, you know, I don't even remember the, when I learned, cause this is supposed to be learned behavior. I don't remember learning why I'm scared, but I know I'm scared. I know that emotionally I can feel when I'm in, you know, things being triggered or I don't feel welcomed or not. So the reality is, is that, I, you know, art just makes it a platform where they can say, oh, you said this. So now I have a reason to make this more hostile for you. But the reality is, is the minute you be, you're yourself in American culture with this skin, you're a threat, you're in danger. And um, that's the why we do need more white allyship. And not only that, we need white folks to understand their privilege when they do come into that space and understand that I don't need no savior. You know what I mean? That part of building that bridge is not telling me what I need or fixing this for me. It's just standing there and saying, I need to figure out who I am in this situation and where my privilege is. And then I need to be okay with the fact that I'm going to um, equally distribute the power. 
because that that's the countership that we need. That is that is what ally true allyship looks like. Um, it's not just no offense. Putting money in our pocket does help. OK, but the reality is also showing up and making sure that when I leave that stage or when I, wherever I'm at, I'm not going to be threatened and I'm going to be hurt. And then it's also bringing me into spaces that are going to be safe for me and creating spaces. We folks can create safe spaces for us, too. We don't always have to create them. I'm going to leave it right there. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. You know, you, you all touched on a theme that, that made me think of a quote. Um, about the, uh, a piece of artwork that I've been obsessing with lately, and I've talked to a few of you about it. It's um, uh, Black is King. It's the Lion King, the gift mm -hmm. uh, that Beyonce gave us through Disney. So if you haven't seen this piece of work, it's on Disney Plus, and it's pretty fantastic. But one of the quotes um, that I'm thinking about because of everything you said is, life is your birthright. They hid it in the fine print. Take mm -hmm. a pen and rewrite it. I mean, there's so many little golden nuggets like that. <laughs> all throughout that whole thing. I love it. It gives me my my, my yeah, power and inspiration. So thank you, Beyonce and Jay-Z for putting that together. Thank you, Disney, yeah. for endorsing it and making sure yeah. everybody could see that beautiful piece of artwork. Um, so we brought up a lot of things that may play against your talent or your ability to fight for social justice, but how do you use your artistic gifts to inspire yourself and others? Ashley. How do I use my artistic gifts to inspire others? And yourself, because um, this is I mean, emotional work. This is hard work for us. It's, it's big work. Um, I'll start with others. I think, um, right, performing. Uh, I think that is where the inspiration comes. Um, a, a mentor of mine that I met at a conference says stories become transformative in the performance. Um, and so it is in this like transfer in this expression um, of my art. And I think the inspiration comes. Um, and so I'm a therapist. And so when I have like uh, patients or clients, I always say that the biggest work is just showing up. The fact that you like decided to like go to this therapy appointment that's work. You know, we don't have to say anything. Like the fact that you decided to come and not cancel is the work. And I think that's where the inspiration is too. It's just like showing up continuously, writing, engaging, performing um, at open mics, going to other people's events. I think that's where I see the inspiration for the community and also to just like build, right? Um, like Poetry 719 just came out of the air because we saw that there was a gap um, and we don't have money we don't have anything we just like do it and so i think that's another inspiration of like you can just do it like that's a call to action for everybody if you see a gap just start doing it right and the support will come and the money will come and you will be upheld by your community but um i think that's one thing that i think is really inspiring and for myself i think writing is like you know when you prick yourself so you can bleed right to know that you're still alive i think when i create and i write art it's like yes girl you're still here right you still have it um because it has been hard right within these past couple of weeks especially with brianna taylor and knowing that my life is worth less than drywall like that that is a deep thing that i am processing and still not through and i haven't really been able to create as much as i would like and so like when i do get to create and share and can pull out a line it's like i'm still here right because poetry is like deeply in my blood it's how i communicate it's how i i heal and so that's what inspires me is just when i can get a line out and it can be crap right i think also art can be bad right i think a lot of people are like love everything you do and all your poetry is like no sometimes stuff isn't good <laughs> and that's okay right you can be like hey i didn't like that and i'm gonna move on or maybe i'll come back to this in a couple of months and i'll pull something out um but i think just being able to do it right and not write for an audience and i'm not sure if other um, artists feel the same way but sometimes i write very specifically because I know an audience is going to like it versus writing for myself. Um, and so that's where that inspiration comes is like, I don't care if anyone gets it or if the audience understands it, I'm writing for myself. Awesome. Thank you, Ashley. Lynn, I want you to answer the same question. How are you using your particular artistic gifts to inspire yourself and others? Um, you know, it, it I'd like to think that I'm ex inspiring others by making sure that the leadership in the theaters in town are accountable. 
by reminding them that art is about making sure everybody has a seat at the table. And sometimes that involves risk because as uh, Goddess Taisha said, sometimes it's about money. Um, and maybe a raisin in the sun is not gonna make as much as Oklahoma, but you do it anyway. You do it anyway because that is your responsibility as an arts institution, is to make sure everybody's story is heard. Everybody's story deserves to be heard. And, um, you know, you don't just pull up a seat at the table for them when it's convenient. Their seat is always there. Their voice is always heard. And so I hope that it, I inspire people by reminding the theater communities. And when I was part of Theater Works, working with someone like Caitlin Lowens, who was committed to making sure everyone had a seat at the table. I met y'all because of Caitlin Owen, Lowens. She was an ally during that time. And that's how we all met. And so um, I hope just working with me was an inspiration for her to go, yeah, we need to do this. I know it was inherent in her coming from Chicago, but you know, hopefully us working together, there was a little bit of inspiration in there as well. Um, so as an artist, I wanna inspire by reminding the art institutions what they're supposed to do. And sometimes that's a risk, but you do it anyway. And you go out into the community and you, you know, you tap into the community. Don't make them come to you. You go to them. Go to where um, the Black community is. Become a part of the Black community so that they feel welcome. Um, I think sometimes the Black community does not feel welcome in our theaters. Um, the Ed Center is beautiful, but it's intimidating. It's intimidating. Someone who, you know, grew up in you know, Southboro like myself <laughs> would drive by that and go, oh, I don't belong there. That's too fancy. Mm -mm. I don't belong there. Unless Alvin Ailey too is there. <laughs> then they're going. <laughs> but they need to feel like they're welcome all the time in that space. And I hope that, you know, through our friendship and our relationships, Ashley and Rodney, you've always felt comfortable coming into that end center like you belong. Mm -hmm. uh, because that was the goal. <laughs> and so I want to inspire the institutions to do better. And they need to have leadership that looks like us, black and brown people. And they need to commit to this and they need to get the institutions that support them and that fund them to do the same. You know, this is the time. This is the time to reinvent yourself with COVID and everything going on. This is the perfect opportunity to reinvent yourself and become something new. This is it. It's not going to be the same as it was before March of 2020. Do it. This is the time, man. People will be willing to come. Yep. The time is now. Got to yeah. get it done now. Tony, I want to ask you about how you um, are using your artistic gifts to inspire yourself and others through our social justice environment. Uh, right along the line with what both ladies have said, Lynn and Ashley, uh, doing some of the same things. You know, but for me, you know, um, just to kind of continue what Lynn was just saying with some of the institutions, I think what we also need to do is we need to kind of like infiltrate because what sometimes happens is, and they know this, they'll, they'll have these institutions here, they have these theaters, and they may purposefully not include, you know, um, things that, that we would relate to or want to go see so that we stay away. So what we need to show them is like, you know what, I mean, I have Alvin Ailey there, we may not have, you know, Tyler Perry, but we're going to come see uh, something totally different because guess what? We appreciate those types of things too. We have an appreciation and, and, and maybe even have experienced some of the uh, some some really good you know artistic things in our in our lifetimes that weren't just rooted in in, in the black experience or the Latino experience. You know, uh, we have to start showing our face a lot more uh, mm -hmm. on a on a from the totality of the situation to to let them know that. You're not going to exclude us just because you think we don't want to come see, you know, Les Miserables or something like that. You know, um, and at the same time, um, we also have to uh, use our creativity kind of like a it's kind of like an interesting dichotomy because we have our voice to talk about what we're dealing with. But we also have just our general creative selves on on diff lots of different topics. You know, I'm a smooth jazz artist, quote unquote. So my audience is very multicultural. 
Um, <clears throat> my, my main demographic is, you know, they're usually about my age or older. Um, and more, you know, people of, uh, uh, well, to do as they say, you know, but then you have your casual fans that come from every walk of life. So I deal with a lot of different types of people that are sincere fans. And these are sincere fans that may not be on the same page as me, you know, uh, on a socioeconomic level, you know, or, or, on, or on a political level. But they love the music. They just love the music. So they could care less at that point, you know, who's playing as long as it sounds good to them. So that in itself inspires me because that's the way you can kind of get into that fine line of uh, where they're comfortable and where they're not because you can start doing things and saying things and playing songs that make them think and showing them, you know, how, how, uh, how diverse our, our, our creativity is, but also let them know that we're unapologetically about who we are, you know? Um, so what I've been able to do, you know, is in, especially from a radio standpoint, there's been some songs that I play uh, that, you know, are very, very um, strong about, what's going on in the world. There's a group called the Black Art Jazz Collective. I played them on my Saturday show. There's a show, there's a song called Tulsa. Now, you know, your average white person might be like, okay, cool, they made a song about Tulsa. No, it ain't a song about Tulsa. It's a song about what happened in Tulsa. So you have to tell people that. You no, know, this song about Tulsa, this is about something that they try to erase from American history, 1921 race riots, Greenwood Archer and Pine Streets. I've actually played there. I played at the Greenwood Cultural Center three times in my career in Tulsa. Um, just recently with the group Surface back in February, and I did my own concert there with another saxophone player uh, a few years back, a couple of times. So I've seen it. I've been in that space and felt that that vibe there. And, um, you know, you have to educate that way, you know, drop those little, you know, tidbits on them, you know, from a radio perspective or, or performing a song and say, you know what, this song was inspired by such and such and such and such and play the heck out of it and have them thinking, going to their phones afterwards like man i didn't know that and so it opens up those 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 uh you know those um it, it brings the context you know a little bit closer and, and it can open up to those those conversations that we all want to have um so that's kind of been my thing you know for, as a musician and as a radio host i'm known on jazz 935 to kind of be like a they call me the scholar sometimes um and i've encouraged all the other hosts to do the same thing bring those little backstories to those songs you know talk about um what might have inspired it the other day i played a song called we almost lost detroit by gil scott heron you know we all should be digging some gil scott heron just so you say everybody that's listening you should be checking gil scott as much as you possibly can well anyway he did a song about uh, about a power plant that was uh almost detonated um a nuclear power plant about 30 miles outside of uh detroit and it was like but then it could have destroyed the whole city. So he told a story about that. And when you see the song, you might think, okay, what does it mean by we almost lost Detroit? I think a lot of people might automatically go to, you know, the race riots that happened in 68 when Martin Luther King was killed. But that was actually about something that could have destroyed the whole entire, you know, um, state of Michigan and part of Canada. And he was really good at telling those stories through music. Um, so a lot of people didn't know that. I had people email me and say, hey, man, I didn't know that's what that song was about. I didn't know anything about Tulsa. You know, I didn't know anything about um, uh, when John Coltrane wrote Alabama, what that was really about. You know, uh, my, my fellow friend, um, Smooth. You lose your brother? Well, Taisha, while we wait for Tony to come back in, I want to address the same question to you. Um, okay. how have your artistic gifts, um, been used to inspire yourself and others through social justice? Welcome back, Tony. Mm -hmm. Um, <laughs> do you want to finish your, um, the ending? You know what? It, that kind of threw me off cause I could see myself, but I knew you guys couldn't see me. I was like, Oh, wait a minute. What was I saying? <laughs> what was I talking about? Um, but anyway, you know, just, you, there's a lot of music out there from, as I'm from a musician standpoint, I'll say this real quick. Um, that you can tell stories about that. You can drop these seeds and plant, uh, you know, some firm um, soil in, in people's minds, what we've been through. And uh, that can be a catalyst to those conversations and, and uh, you know, making things better. Thank you, Tony. Goddess Taisha. Um, 
<laughs> I think my art is really inspired by young people. Um, I think that I'm inspired all the time by young people. I feel like one of the things that, one of my goals is to bring up young people because unfortunately we have ageism going on <laughs> a lot in Colorado Springs and we, you know what I mean? And the fact that, so I feel like I'm very much inspired. Um, my art is inspired by young people. Um, what is it? <laughs> The way they see and manip the way they see the world is so empowering, and so that inspires a lot of my work to say that if I'm doing that at my age, I'm deciding to come out here and do art, and you know what I mean. And kind of what like Lynn was talking about, like kind of being like I can reinvent. I reinvent myself every year. Ashley noticed, <laughs> you know what I mean? Because the reality is that sometimes we don't think we we think we have to live in a box, you know. When reality, we get to be whoever we want to be every day that we show up. And however that looks needs to be honored, understood, and all of those things. I think some people, I don't care. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm going to live in my truest self. And that has really inspired my art to feel like I can take it to that next level of being like, yes, I know what has happened historically, but this is the new era of what's happening, right? And progression is happening, and it's only going to happen if we allow it to happen. And when we have different minds and understandings is when we get a full full understanding of what that looks like. I think that has also inspired a lot of my art to be very much about like history and and more political education because the reality and recently it's been more about spiritually being in tune with one's emotions and how we're carrying that emotion in society. But a lot of that has been inspired by me wanting to do my own healing and, and wanting to do my own healing because I don't want to hurt other people. The real the realism is that post traumatic slave syndrome is a real thing. Look it up, <laughs> right? Um, all these understandings of what we've been taught culturally have really hurt each other. Have has been really influential to hurting each other. You know, the bottom of the crack barrel is a real theory. It is a real thing that happens, and we do it in the black community. And part of that has, in my art, has been inspired through healing myself. Um, honoring myself, loving all the pieces of myself, every curve, every piece, everything that doesn't fit in a box, those in particular, and leaning into that discomfort so I can grow. So recently my art has been inspired through that and also wanting to teach that to young folks so that they don't do the same thing we do, right? When we hurt people, when young people are, you know, we're re really quick to say, oh, young people this and young people that. The realism is that they are a reflection of the generation before them and the generations before them. And so we need to take a little bit more accountability. And I feel like they inspire my art to be like, I can grow and I can change and I can look like this and I can also heal. I really, I really appreciate that. Now that I have four really amazing leaders in our community who are artists, um, there was a question, well, more of a statement that came up on the chat that um, concerned me. And I guess you guys all see it now. DeAndre says, as a tall, athletic black man, I have had to make myself small so that people are not afraid of me. So I have a personal relationship with that statement, but I don't want to go first. I want Tony, as an artist and a leader, to tell this brother what to make of that situation. How can he overcome that? And then I'll go to my sisters on the same response. Mm -hmm. Oh man, that's that's a deep one right there. I, I love the analogy. As a tall, I've, I've had to make myself fall for people. To, you know, it's amazing that the different things that we have to do psychologically just to, to function in this country. Young brother, don't make yourself small. You stand on your, on all, you stand up tall, man and you fire on all eight cylinders at all times. You know, sometimes you're gonna have to let people just, you know, if they're intimidated, then they just shall be intimidated. But you know, you carry yourself in a manner that is, um, is strong, is, you know, of a gentleman-like quality. Uh, you, you continue to, you know, to be, I'm pretty sure, you know, you're a friendly guy, a fun-loving guy, easygoing guy, you know, be, be who you are. You know, we, we can no longer afford to allow those different things to, to get in our way, um, you know, keep, keep it in the back of your mind. But a lot of times, um, I, I would say as a man, just, just stand right where you are and, and don't let, don't let that stop you from progressing. Thank you, Tony. Um, DeAndre, I want you to know also 
um, and everybody else on this call and that are listening to us, um, our sisters have a lot of power and a lot of um, knowledge to give their brothers. So that's why I want to hear from my sisters now. Uh, Ashley, you go ahead and, and help this brother with this um, with this situation going on in his mind. What do you, what do you tell him? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, and thank you, DeAndre, for that question and for your like lived experience. I think um, similar to what Tony said, like this is in the back of our minds all the time, right? Like when I go to, when I drive, do I have my ID? <laughs> do, am I doing everything right? Like how are people gonna perceive me? And so um, as someone who is not allowed to show emotion all of the time because I know it will affect everything, how people perceive me. Um, I would say one, uh, do what you need to do sur to survive, right? There are some things that we do that are survival techniques that we have to do um, in order to make sure we make it uh, through a traffic stop to make sure we can make it the way home. And sometimes we don't have control over that. Um, but what I say to you is find the areas in your life where you get to be huge and big and vibrant and like loud, right? And maybe that's in uh, like you and your sports and being athletic, maybe that's in the work that you do. Um, but if, right, if it's a matter of like survival, cause I'm a therapist, so that's always where my mind goes of like, if you're not safe in one situation and have to be small, find an area of your life where you can express yourself fully, deeply and authentically. Right. Um, because you don't have to be small all the time, right? You get to pick and choose where you are, where you are like living fully um, and deeply. And so that's the advice that I would give. Um, is protect yourself, stay safe. Um, and there are so many ways where you can express yourself fully in a way that you feel safe and that you can make it through. Lynn, what guidance do you have for this brother? Um, well, I could, Ashley stole of us verbatim what I was going to say, um, because uh, by all means, you need to make sure that you take care of yourself and you don't put yourself in a situation where something can happen to you. But uh, like Tony said, always walk tall and find a place in your life where you can always be who you are and feel accepted and safe. You need to identify a safe zone with allies and when your allies are with you they need to help stop that perpetual stereotype of black men being scared sorry you know black men being scary that's where that comes from i have a black son who you know i have to tell make sure you know if you're pulled over you got to do this but you find a place in your life where you feel 100 percent comfortable being who you are i have two black brothers who are tall you know, they are big guys. My father was a large man, um, but they lived their lives the way that they wanted to. But they also were respectful and cognizant of being safe. Black man, black men. So I am from Georgia and my mother, I am 6'5 and 230-ish pounds, thanks to COVID. Um, <laughs> so what my mother always told me is to make sure I stand up straight with my back straight and my chin up. And don't ever let anybody make me feel like I'm smaller or less than what they are or less than what I am. Um, that I come from a great lineage of people that have struggled and despite the struggle have still been able to succeed at a great many things from getting out of slavery to putting people on the moon. Like, dude, just go back and find all the history that was erased out of K through 12, and you'll find all the strength that you need. It's from your ancestors. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the quotes from um, the Black is King soundtrack, which I just keep alluding back to because it's so beautiful. Uh, and I was telling this to my friend, uh, Stephanie, Stephanie Rose Spalding, uh, Dr. Stephanie, what's going on, my sister? So she was feeling, you know, this is draining work. This is emotional work that we're doing right now and um, look up at the stars. When you get lost, you'll find your way back because your ancestors are up there. They're looking at you and you have the strength of generations behind you, man. Do not be ashamed of who you are. Don't anybody make you feel ashamed. You keep fighting. You keep being strong and you keep being proud and you learn how to communicate your passions in a way that build bridges and communities 
not only your own community, but communities that aren't like yours. And there's so many ways to communicate. That's why we're here today talking about art. Art has so many different pieces to it. And there's so many ways to communicate through it, through theater, through spoken word, through dance, through music, so many ways. Find your way to communicate, brother. And that's all my brothers and sisters out there and everybody else who's listening. Do not be afraid of being who you are. You have, you have a right to be here. So walk around like you have a right to be here and people will respect you. They'll respect you because they have no choice but to respect you because you'll command nothing less than other people yes. respect because you give respect, right? I'm gonna get off my soapbox with that yes. one and move on to the next question. That one, that one caught me when I saw it in the chat. I was like, oh brother, mm -mm. no, we gotta, we gotta address that one. So my next question um, for, for Lynn, what would a new reality look like? A new world, a new American theater? I think a new American theater will look like the world it, it exists in um, and also reflect the, the hope of what the world should be. And that should be all of us working together united to make a difference in this world, to make this world better for the young people and the children that come behind us. We are the next ancestors, right? We need to do our job because the folks who came before us kicked some serious ass so that we could be here where we are today. And I think we have an obligation to every young person in this world, black, white, red, brown, Catholic, Jewish, Muslim, it doesn't matter to make this world a better place than we found it. That is our job. That is my job as a mother, is to make this world better for my kids. And it's through art, it's through activism, it's through, you know, climate change, run for office, you know, whatever it needs, needs to happen for you to be an influence in your community to make the world better. So I expect American theater to do just that, to reflect the world that it exists in and to make it better. That is their job. And so it starts today. There's no better time than now. And that is our obligation as artists is to make this world better as human beings. And we could do it through so many different platforms, mm -hmm. through, through Tony, you know, just hearing him talk about Tulsa and giving that backstory. That's an influence. Ashley standing up on that stage talking about the pain of being who you are in this world that tells you you shouldn't be here or you're lesser than. That is the obligation. It's mine by making sure that stories written designed, directed by people of color get done in this town. That's what the new American theater looks like. It looks like the world we live in and then stuff and the world we want it to be. And it's very important that we support that work when we see it. I'm sure we've all seen Black Panther and loved it. That was a great work of art. You know, I keep talking about Black is King. That's a great work of art. Um, You've been watching, um, was it Regina King just got an Emmy for The Watchmen on HBO. That's so right. A lot of people, Tony, yeah. were woken up to the Tulsa 1921 issue for the very first time. Oh, like, yeah. Mm -hmm. have plans yeah. Oh, my God. Man. And that is an example it's crazy. of us being able yeah. to be behind the wheel and telling those stories. That's right. Sometimes yes. we're responsible yes. for telling the stories. Um, I'll give mm -hmm. you another one. Jordan Peele, the comedian, yes. seems to like horror movies now, which is interesting. <laughs> But his uh, television <laughs> remake of The Twilight Zone, season one, episode three, that one, okay. the one with Shania Lathan and her son in it, that one, oh, that one made me yeah. emotional with the rewinding camera. That was real. But that's us being able to tell the story through yes. art because now people are listening to it because they're watching it on television. Um, Tony, mm -hmm. the question I wanted to ask you, has your fan base increased or diminished through social media due to your opinions? feelings or stance on recent events? Um, you know, I've seen a few, few, uh, less folks, uh, mm. few, few unfriends, <laughs> you know, uh, some blocks a few times. And I haven't been probably as, as vocal as I probably could be or should be. I've kind of told the line. I've kind of looked at some of my mentors in the business, like the Gerald Albright's and the Najee's and the Kim Waters and, you know, the, the greats of contemporary jazz that I, that are my peers 
and, and, and friends indeed, but I kind of watched them because they, they kind of set a really strong example um, of kind of what not to do, what to do and what not to do on social media, just in general. But then I've seen some other folks who don't look like me, who've been unapologetically vocal. And it's like, wait a minute. Why is, you know, and it's kind of funny because they almost get away with it and we don't. Which is, you know, that's that ally thing. Like, okay, he can say whatever he wants to and they'll listen. But if I say it, it might be taken the wrong way or I might lose some friends or maybe, uh, you know, uh, I might have a fan or two that, you know, they're, they're supporters of, of the other side or something like that. So I've seen a, a, sl- a slight diminishing of, uh, of in certain areas. I can almost tell because it'll be either just a forwarded post or just a quick, hey, check this out. Like just the other day, I posted the um, a link about when Trump was stumbling for his words when they asked him to uh, denounce white supremacy. And I put, you know, two eyeballs in my, in my, um, in my, uh, in my feed, like, are we watching this? I didn't say anything. I didn't give an opinion either way. I just posted like, watch. In other words, I was saying, be mindful, keep your senses. There's a lot that he didn't say, but he spoke volumes in that little bit of time. Well, a couple of people inbox me, you know, then all of a sudden, you know, I'm usually full with my friend list. I can never keep, I have, I'm backed up on both of my pages. I might need a third Facebook page because uh, both my pages are like a hundred and something friend requests backed up. I feel bad, but I don't know if I can maintain three pages. I have a hard enough time maintaining the two that I have plus my music page. So when I saw me go down to like 496, I was like, hmm. And then, you know, when I, then there's a few more that, that dropped after that. And I thought, let me look and see who's not here anymore. And there was a couple of uh, friends that support, you know, our president um, that just unfriended me. And I thought, well, OK, fine. Nobody that I interacted with on a regular basis, but I could tell they were fans, you know, just genuine fans. And it makes you wonder, like, OK, just because I play saxophone and it's entertaining to you doesn't mean I don't have a voice. I don't have feelings. I mean, do we, do I have to agree with you on all life principles for you to be a fan of mine? Do you know how many people that I love their music, but probably wouldn't like them personally, wouldn't get along with them, or they're on a totally different side of the fence, maybe from a spiritual side or political side or whatever the case may be, or we just may have that two, we may just have disagreements because we're two totally different individuals just because we're, you know, and I hate that black entertainers go through this all the time. It's like, you put us in this box, you like what we do, buy our music, come to our shows, but that's where it stops. As long as we stay right there, like I was saying earlier, we don't get black on you. You know, we don't get, then then we're acceptable. Um, but you would think that with their, their, their supporting of our entertainment, that that wouldn't even be a boundary that would even have to be considered. So, um, so yeah, I've seen I've seen a diminishing, you know, every now and then. You know, I don't I don't do it too much, but I'm trying to find that 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 balance. I'm trying to find that line where I can start saying more about how I'm really feeling. Because I feel like at this point it doesn't matter anymore. I'm I'm to the point where I'm so upset and so ready to articulate my feelings that you know what? Get off my friend my Facebook page if that's how you feel. I don't care anymore. There's lots of other fans to be gained on this, and there's a lot of the true supporters out there that'll stick by me and uh you know continue to support so if you want to go because i feel a certain kind of way about something i can't be too concerned about that anymore yeah i totally agree with you brother i appreciate you bringing that perspective to light um ashley thank you uh, community organizer what are some of the ways people can get involved with social justice ah, ah um, yes <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, one of the things that I really like that Lynn said earlier was like, engage with the communities that you are attempting to support or advocate for. Um, So if you're interested in supporting the Black Lives Matter movement or uplifting like black artists, go into black communities, um, go to our events, come to the barbecues at the park, like go go to where we are. I think my kind of driving force has been Uh, don't show up just for black trauma and pain and death, show up for black joy, right? And so what I see often is that people only show up (laughs) when something tragic happened, right? And that's not necessarily like advocacy and I'm not gonna trust you similar to what what Lynn said. I see this all the time where people may be campaigning or they want something. And so all of a sudden you show up to our events 
all of a sudden, right, there's all this interest in the black community. And as soon as you get what you want, I don't see you at any events anymore. Um, so that's what I would say, like, go to those events, engage in those communities, talk to people. I think that's the first part of activism. And um, a word that I always love to pair with allyship is being an accomplice, right? I want you to be an accomplice, right? If I'm going down for something, I want you to be implicated too. <laughs> like, you got to be in this as much as I am. Um, and so that's the kind of like strength and fervor that I'm looking for. Um, so if you're trying to get involved, um, I think figure out how you want, right? How are the ways that you want to get involved in terms of social justice? And it can be folks who want to engage in, in theater and talk about like theater of the oppressed. It can be through music, through poetry, through art, through installations, figure out what it is and then engage with that community. I think that is the biggest part. Um, and also, make it right if you're like wow no one is actually addressing this thing you can start it and there's the thing i love about colorado springs in our arts community is that there's so many people doing incredible work um and so link up with someone right um as lynn said we are the ancestors like we are becoming that and we are also mentors um so if you anyone listening anyone trying to get involved ask us reach out to us like let us know that you're interested because we all went through that same process and so um as much as like we are on this panel like we can also help people get into the systems and the networks that they want to be um and my big thing is that social justice is protesting in the streets right it is the demonstrations it is these this public announcement um and it's right putting plays on right it's getting people access and we often talk about like equality and equity and equity is removing the barrier so that everyone has the ability to reach it right um so think about how you can break down some barriers who can you drive to the theater who can you get a ticket who can you tell about like tony exum um playing right how can you start to break down the barriers and it can be subtle it's not always standing in front of someone to take a bullet although come through, protect me, I need that. And there's so many other ways that you can leverage your privilege um, and leverage yourself so that you can create activism within this community, right? Because it is an ecosystem. Each and every one of us is important. And the system that is created, that is oppressing us currently, is counting on you to do nothing. The system is counting on you to do exactly what you have always been doing. So I charge you all, if you wanna get involved, do something different. Do something different, right? Attend something you wouldn't normally do. Talk to someone you wouldn't normally do. But that's gonna mess up the system, right? Cause we're not trying to fix it cause it's working perfectly. What we're doing is recreating a new system, right? We're doing one, as Lynn says, right? This new world that reflects what we're going through. Um, so do one thing different, right? The system is expecting you to stay silent and do nothing. So it is your charge as an activist to not, right? To speak up, stand up, do something, um, but you have to act. You have to act. And one of the cool things I heard Ashley say was, if you don't see something that needs to exist, create it. Matter of fact, matter of fact, I got something like that, that somebody did. Hold, hold on, let, let me show you what this is. You see this right here? You see that right there? This is what happens when a creative, Brandon Barnes and his beautiful wife, Janine, come up with something that doesn't exist. And they create something like this. Oh yeah, oh yeah, it's nice, it's nice. And this ain't the first one. There's so many of them. And that is a testament of creatives doing some good work in this community just like my panelists and just like so many more of you that are out there in the community doing the good work that needs to be done. Now on my next point of the allies and the accomplices and the advocates, y'all see that right there? I want to say thank you to uh, Angela Seals, who's on the back end of this thing, running it as an administrator. Thank you so much. You've done so much to make this event uh, a reality and, and and come to fruition as good as it did tonight. And I want to thank my dear friend and fellow Rotarian, Andy Vick, for, you know, coming up with this idea. He was like, Rodney, I don't know how this looks, but like, can we do this? And that was it. It was just like, a <laughs> I was like, sure, man, this is great. When you want to do it? October 1st. I'm like, all right, let's do it. And it's done. Here it is. Yeah. So thank you so much to my panel. You're amazing. 
Continue doing the great work that you're Thank doing you. and making this community better every day that you are in it. So please don't leave. And uh, now we'll give the floor back to my friend Andy. It's all yours, sir. Well, you've made it a tough act to follow. Uh, I would reciprocate the thanks to you, Rodney, for pulling together this panel uh, and for orchestrating the conversation. And then to Ashley, Tony, Lynn, and Goddess Taisha, thank you so much for speaking your truth, for sharing, and for helping all of us to understand a small part of what your reality looks like, and for then giving us some ideas for how we can move forward. Um, I, I really liked uh, at the end there, Ashley, when you talk about going out and uh, enjoying the cultural experience uh, at a good time, uh, when things are positive. And you know, to pull it back to what Arts Month is all about, that's exactly what it is, inviting community to come out and to celebrate the creativity in our community, uh, the talent of local artists, and uh, your Cyber Poetry Festival, for example, that's coming up later in October. Um, that's a great opportunity for people to go out and have that one new cultural experience uh, in a very positive and uplifting kind of way. So I would encourage everyone who's watching uh, to heed the wisdom that was shared tonight, uh, to visit artsoctober.com so you can find out what these creatives are doing during the month of October and what the many other creatives throughout our region are doing, uh, doing during October. This is a time to celebrate arts and culture. And I can't think of any more uh, appropriate way, especially in the context of what's happened over the past couple months, to launch Arts Month 2020 this evening uh, with all the wisdom and insight that you all have shared. So thank you all for being here. Thank you again, Rodney, for putting this all together on your end. Thank you, Angela, for running the uh, AV behind the scenes and making it all work. And I would invite everyone who's out there right now to engage in the creative community that is so rich and robust here in our uh, region. Visit artsoctober.com, uh, enjoy Arts Month, and I hope you will heed again the wisdom that was shared this, tonight, and we can all work towards a better community here in the Pikes Peak region and throughout our country. So thank, thank you all for being here this evening. I hope you enjoyed it, and uh, happy Arts Month to everyone.